okay so we we can have a look uh, for example this uh, website geonames uh, and uh, as we as the slide says uh, uh, all the names are also represented uh, in an ontology we don't know what an ontology is yet uh, but actually it's uh, a set of uh, standard uh, let's call it like that for the moment uh, mm -hmm. uh, standard representation of every uh, city so for every uh, every place every location uh, we we have uh, a description like this like this part uh, of the page so for example if uh, uh, we chose I don't know let's say we want to go to uh, Rome in uh, in our location uh, Rome is uh, a string so this website will check all the uh, concept uh, that in their literal literals so attributes uh, literal attributes uh, connected by some kind of uh, relationship uh, uh, map uh, uh, contain the string rom and here there are many different uh, entries for example there is a rom city in the united states and the rom city of course in italy and uh, the two are different because if you have a look at the address here in the every every these are uh, these people are, uh, have a very conservative approach they use numbers <laughs> as you arrive this number here is clearly different from this number there but also this number is different from the entry number eight here which is again in the same city in italy so what's the difference between one and eight here well actually they are different entries but you see that uh, the first number one is a capital and uh, number eight uh, is a second order administrative division so it's the head of a region huh? in Italy. so the first order administrative divisions are countries then there are regions then there are provinces in Italy. somewhere else we may have may, may have counties they have lenders, they have different administrative divisions at different levels. So, uh, the same city uh, is represented many times because it represents different uh, uh, concepts. Once you, you may be looking for the capitals of the, of the different countries, and or in other sense, you may be looking for the um, capoluogo di provincia in it, uh, di regione no? in, uh, in Italy and you see that this, num uh, this number here with ends with 070 is different from this one okay because they represent different concepts about probably the same city if we go for example we choose this one uh, this is just an interface that shows us the most uh, popular interesting information if you go inside okay we have all the information we say that this is the full name and uh, these are the administrative divisions italy and then latium and then rome and all the, and the coordinates and so on this is the number and all this information is also represented oh, uh, in, in rdf Maybe we see alternate names could be useful which is all the translations of the word for the same word rom how do you say that in different names and so all the information here about uh, this element here where is that sorry i need to close it I lost it. The interface is not uh, 
crystal could but the nice part is that at the given point we have the link here to an rdf file so this is the in all these websites that uh, represents all the information in in rdf and here we have all the information about uh, this uh, subject about you see that we have uh, let's let's see all the rdf collapsed we have uh, one subject which is this string that represents the city of rome and this is a feature this feature is defined by an rdf file as a name which is a literal rome it has many official names for different languages you see here so the relationship official name is for different languages it has an alternate name roma so the official name is rome and the alternate name here is roma it may have short names other official names how can there be more than one official name because the language changes these names are literals in that in some cases are identical but we never check the identity of literal so we, we don't exploit we don't know this information feature class uh, describe in this ontology in this representation used to uh, to um, uh, describe what kind of object this is so it's an al a is an administrative division a at the m2 is an administrative division of type of level two so it's both things here country code it population is a number position and so on and uh, uh, parent feature means it's contained into this other resource you see that a uh, resource of sorry links another resource what is that parent feature you can try to go there and it's uh, it corresponds to Lazio the region then when with this will respond and Lazio again will have another descriptor like that so imagine we try to draw um, this is so slow but an RDF graph for this we have all of this all of this uh, block of RDF is they are all um, properties of the same subject the subject is that 316 1969 It's not a good name, but in a system that generates automatically this content, it's just an identifier with all the prefix, of course, that, that is in front. And then it has a lot of uh, relationship, for example, is defined by another resource. So we have another resource which is called 3169069 less about dot rdf with this relationship is defined by name wrong so we will say name rectangle wrong okay so we need to like that official name official name is uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, Città Metropolitana di Roma Capitale Città Barola Capitale which is for the Italian language and so all of these are different representations if we look at the um, we said uh, this one parent feature points to another feature called 3174 
like this, parent feature. This would be the region ratio. And again, this will expand to its own graph. So we have uh, some leaks that are sort of uh, property leaks. Information that is private associated to this specific item. And then there are links that connect different objects. Okay, they're all the same from the RDF point of view. But from the, our modeling point of view, we have a sort of a, a cloud, a small cloud of information that surrounds this concept, which is a main concept we said. Then, this other concept has all these associated information, and these are connected in a different way. You can have all the type of connections. Uh, you know that we see in the, the parent feature, the parent administrative division will be an administrative division on level one, would be Lazio, but country this will be mapped to Italy, and so on. <coughs> and children features says all the other geographical names that are contained within Rome. I don't know whether it has any, probably are uh, the. Roma is divided in municipio, one, two, three, four, like we have the Ficor Sezione, different in sub, sub part of the city. So it's another link uh, to another RDF document that will describe it. Let's check, I don't know what we can find there. Probably a list of other items to be opened. Yeah, a list of other, this, sorry, this, 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 and they are uh, Paolo, uh, Belletri, Guidonia, Agosta, Arsoli. I'm not very familiar with the geography of Rome, but all of these are inside Rome. You see that, all, for example, this one has a, na sorry, a name, Morricone, and as a parent, the parent of this node is our node of Rome. It's ten numbers. So we are, we are in a different RDF file here, describing different cons. You see that this defines uh, many different nodes. Each of them has a relationship parent with our previous one. But these are different files. They are only, they are, you, 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 we are imagining them merged in a single big file because this name is the same. Hmm? So it's a way of representing this information. And of course, it's easy to make uh, mistakes or so. So, for example, the W3C offered a validator tool, a validation tool that we can also use when we write our code by hand. We hope so we can, for example, copy all of this. and paste it here and hopefully focus and graph you should read this document uh, check whether it's correct and also be able to uh, what's wrong here rdf is not bound okay So it says that the RDF prefix. So there's some namespace information missing here. For some reason. Not complete here because uh, because uh, typing error. Okay. 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 This is more. So it breaks down all the XML into the set of triples. So this is actually what every RDF parser will do. We do as the first step to break down everything into triples. 
we see that most of these are, uh, are the same subject and at the end uh, it draws uh, it tries to draw sort of what we try to draw uh, the blackboard before and this is just one uh, one type of file where we have ma uh, many pieces of information attached to a single subject okay not all uh, but it, do it doesn't need to be like that for example if we use uh, we find the these are we this other file that contains let's try to draw it here uh, maybe you can sort of paste the URL directly. Uh, validator, let's open another window. Check the URI, status and graph. So. Okay, the other, you know, well, the, the, the other file with all the contents, again, is a long list of triples and the, the graph would be much different. Okay, it's too, it's too big. It, it isn't able to, to generate it. But we will see a graph with uh, many different uh, subjects. You see the subject, every subject has three or four or five different, uh, see for example, this one is a subject for four different uh, relationships, properties, and what they have in com what all these uh, uh, sub parts of graphs have, have in common is this uh, parent feature, which is the same in every one of them. But all the rest is different. So uh, there are very small parts of graph, and all of them will link to this parent feature. You can imagine that this parent feature will be this one here. So many small parts link to this one, and this will link to others, and so on. So uh, they are actually very difficult to visualize because we have a very the language is very low level. Triples. And so we tr if we try to visualize all of them at the same time, uh, we have very huge diagrams and we easily get lost, okay? Uh, the good part is that we usually don't write this information by hand, uh, but have them processed by, um, by tools. We see that this website usually defines their own, see, predicates except in some cases for example in the um, latitude and longitude coordinates they use another vocabulary defined elsewhere so they try to reuse some vocabularies and in other cases they uh, use the same they define their own uh, definitions from the user point of view okay it's just a map or a geographical information system uh, that happens to use an ontology as the, uh, the basic representation behind it, okay? But it's not, there's nothing special with it. it. The end user usually don't, don't see, don't care about that. But for flexibility, imagine how many types of geographical name you find. Mountains, rivers, lakes, and a river has some property, and a lake has different properties, and a city, or the name of a city could be also the name of the region, or the name of the province, and so there are all these uh, different uh, flavors for a name and uh, that are very difficult to capture if you had a, a very uh, rigid data structure like a, or structure as a structure like a database uh, where you might define the fields and uh, with an with an RDF representation you are very much more flexible you when you know the name in a different language you describe it when you know the uh, coordinates, you add them, and so on. Hmm? 
of course uh, you will later add the problem of uh, uh, um, completeness you are never sure of what information is attached to your name so probably for rome which is an important city we have a lot of information if you take the village around the corner probably many many you know, the population will not be there you don't know the coordinates if everybody ever cared and input in them and so on so maybe not every attribute is uh, available in every name, but that's a, it's a better quality problem. Okay, uh, we saw that, uh, well, apart from the, from the diagram, which becomes very huge uh, quite quickly, also the XML representation is not very easy to read, especially it's not very easy to write. Writing by hand, uh, it would make um, hundreds of, of mistakes. So over the times, uh, they developed a, a, a simpler notation, which is uh, uh, called the turtle notation, which is a, a completely equivalent to the XML one, but much easier and much shorter. Uh, basically, you list uh, triples separate on uh, we separate in subject uh, predicate and object on different lines, then a blank line. Subject, predicate, object, blank line. Subject, predicate, object, blank line, and so on. The only syntax that we have is this full stop character here that ends uh, the triple. Subject, predicate, object, full stop, <coughs> empty line, and so on. So it's very simple because it doesn't have all the XML infrastructure, the quotes and the tags and so on. It can also be shortened because you see that uh, in this slide, for example, the subject is the same for these four statements. So there is a limited amount of syntax to, uh, okay, this is the, the syntax for subject, predicate, object, full stop. Um, but there's a limited amount of, uh, of syntax, first for avoiding uh, write, writing the URI, uh, the, the, the complete URL every time. So, for, for example, instead of writing every time w3.org slash people slash em and so on, you can just uh, define a prefix that goes until, until uh, people and then you write prefix uh, um, colon em.me. Em so it's just a, a way of defining, well, in XML they are called namespaces, here they are called prefixes. But it's just uh, de de uh, declaring strings that will be concatenated to the. So this is much more readable, also. Okay. And uh, we can see that the subject is the same, so we can merge different uh, statements with the same subjects by separating them with a semicolon. Instead of a full stop, if you have a semicolon on the next line, only two fields are expected: the predicate and the object because the subject is carried over from the previous statement. So you see that Eric Miller, con full name Eric Miller, semicolon, Eric Miller is implicit again, then the mailbox and the mail and so on. So if you, if you need to repeat the subject, you can have a, a semicolon. And if you need also to repeat the, uh, if you have the several statements with the same subject and the same uh, um, predicate, but many objects, like we have there with the um, official name. We have the same subject, the same predicate, official name, but we have many different relationships from wrong official name with the very, very, uh, various variations of the official name. And so we can do that with a comma here. So this comma means uh, Eric Miller, personal title, doctor, full stop, Another one, Eric Miller, again, again, personal title, again, prof, as the second uh, try. So with these simple, very, very simple compacting rules, uh, if you write the, your list in alphabetical in alphabetical order, you have all the same, the same subject, and so you write the subject once uh, and separate all the statements with semicolons. And if if you happen to have a block of statements that have the same uh, um, predicate also you can write the predicate once and list with have a list uh, a comma separated list uh, of all the possible objects so that's why this uh, notation is called the 
T terms very because it's very uh, synthetic uh, compared to the two XML. Uh, well, there's, there are also other variations, more or less simple, more or less flexible about this uh, um, notation, but uh, we don't uh, we don't use them. So, for example, let's try to to use this uh, representation method for imagine you are we are we are working into a news agent. Okay, so we want to okay we are uh, we have journalists that we write news, uh, but we want also to have a, a searchable archive of the news and we want it to be searchable not just by text but also by content maybe we are specialized we are specialized in financial news so i pulled the one press uh, release from a company several years ago which was basically one of the most painful press releases in the history in, in the co in uh, computer engineering when oracle merged with java with uh, some microsystems and uh, we all loved my my some microsystems as much as, as we all hated oracle so that was very it was really a sad day uh, but anyway um so imagine we are here and we want to describe it, this news as an RDF file, as an RDF topic. Mm scanning the text uh, looking for things to identify concepts names companies actions to identify some are easier some are fuzzier you know you always find that uh, uh, develop the technologies that power the global marketplace that are totally total bullshit okay you know, all the companies always say these very big sentences about themselves that the experts don't mean anything. You will find that these are the most difficult to translate, or it's better to skip them because they, they don't <laughs> contribute real information. What what does really say? I could say that for a, for a bicycle company, <laughs> it's the same. It doesn't bring any real information. No? It's just marketing bullshit. But remains the fact, the facts that are described in this text. If I were an investor looking for the dynamic of prices of companies and so on, some information here is important. Here we have some information about one company, some information about another company, and some key information about an acquisition. So, how can we write it? So, let's try to write it in, a, in Notepad. So, very simple. Try to. So, well, there's some, some information which is easy about the companies. So, first of all, we need to decide what, uh, what identifier we use for these two companies that are described here. Okay, so maybe we can link to this NASDAQ identifier. We use this. For sure, NASDAQ has, al has already uh, acronyms for all the companies that are mentioned or that are quoted in the, in, the, in the stock exchange. I don't know whether actually they have uh, some uh, ontology for describing all of them, but we can, we can assume it is. 
we can uh, create our own our own identifiers that will probably be later be mapped so we can use Im imagine that we have something like uh, http nasdaq.com slash company slash uh, so, sorry hash uh, or orcr for example that will present uh, the um, Oracle company and so for for us it's better to define this as a prefix NASDAQ as this so that when you are when we predicate something when we assert something about uh, uh, Oracle we just write NASDAQ semicolon Oracle or NASDAQ sorry semicolon Java we don't have to repeat everything it's much more readable and we f the first thing we don't we want to do is to define a name company name So Oracle as a company name of what the text says, uh, Oracle Corporation. And the other one is a company name of Sound Microsystem Inc. Full stop here for the moment. Being. What is company name? Oh, we should define an identifier for representing the company names. So we can decide that we create our own like geonames did they created their own identifiers to represent the properties that they are they were interested in or we can search if there is any vocabulary that already contains information about this okay so let's assume we are creating our own our own news website and so or news application you know finance news dot com slash concepts so company name would become news company name they will map to an RDF concept that we propose huh? we are the finance news finance news it's got too many Or if you find that the vocabulary with already this concept defined, it's better for us. Okay, we don't have to specify that. And we can go forward. So the other information is uh, uh, the websites. We have information on the website for Sun and for Oracle. So this that is not the only information that we have. So semicolon news website. Is, and this is not a literal, it's a URI, actually. Oracle.com. Right? Dot, dot, Oracle, yes. And the other one, again, we replace the full stop with a semicolon and we describe the website with the sun.com. These are the easy paths. Uh, okay. So we have, like, you have one graph all with all the properties around the Oracle. Another graph, part of the graph, with 
many properties about Java. And then we have, so these are sort of background information that is already there. And then we have the news for today. The news is that Sun and Oracle announced something, and this announce is about an acquisition. So it's not a real acquisition today. It's just an announcement. Okay. So we must separate the information about the announcement from the information about the acquisition. We create one node about the announcement. So it will be news, announcement, one, two, three, four. And something about uh, news acquisition, seven, eight, nine. Maybe we have hundreds of, of announcements uh, and uh, hundreds of acquisitions to represent. So that's why I created one name, one unique name, unique inside my system. Every day we have new announcement, they will get new identifiers inside our, say, domain news. And so this announcement, what do we know about the announcement? The announcement was made by Oracle and Java. Or Java and Oracle made the announcement. But there are four words. Java and Oracle made the announcement. Or the announcement was made by Java and Oracle. I cannot fit four words into a triple. I, I must break it down into two triples. So these announcements could be issued by, maybe news again to qualify our, by Oracle. And comma Nasdaq Java Sun. Okay, we have one subject. These are, these are actual two statements. Announcement one two three four issued by Oracle. Another statement. Announcement one two three four issued by Sun. Because they have a comma here. That keeps the same subject and predicate and uh, links them to different, uh, creates many relations with, with different objects. Then, what do we know? Well, uh, today. So there is a date associated with the announcement. So we can say that this announcement is was issued on or issue date, for example, more explicit. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, it was probably 1995 uh, or something like that. Uh, I don't remember. Let's see if if it's still. I don't know whether it's still online or not. Or they try to delete go to the right history. I said that. 20, 2009. No, no, I don't. No, no, no. Sorry. April 20, 2009. So, 2009. 20, uh, 04. 20. And what did they announce? Then they announced the acquisition. So we must link the announcement with the acquisition itself. And so we have, uh, uh, how, do, how can we call it? Uh, type of announcement. <coughs> New. 
news acquisition 789 for example And about the acquisition, what can we say? Well, the acquisition is between these two companies. While uh, the announcement was issued by both of them, so they were at the same level, the acquisition, we cannot say, use the same predicate both for the acquiring and the acquired company. We need two different statements. The announcement, Ria, say, okay, these are the authors of the announcement. They speak of an acquisition, but up to, up to now, we don't know who is acquiring whom. The acquisition tells us this information. So that uh, news is um, acquiring or acquiring company would be Oracle. So not, 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 not semi common here. And the acquired company would be Sun. And the acquisition price would be uh, $950. And maybe we can also say that this information has been announced here. in this news, this announcement. So actually, we are breaking down a statement into its basic facts, very, very elementary facts. And we are creating a network of these nodes. We have a, an uh, announcement type No, I don't like it, because this is not an announcement type. An announcement type uh, would map if I call a, a relationship, a probably a number type, I would have probably acquisition, uh, merging, uh, closing, or whatever. Okay. So I have there are, I, there are there are actually two different concepts: the type of the acquisition and uh, the actual details about the acquisition, uh, the, the, the deal. Say. So yes, but uh, I would say this is a company acquisition. And then we have another relationship that will make map the details. That are here, actually. They made a lot of typos here. So they are separate. And this also tells us that we can be explicit that this concept, we, we, we name it acquisition 789, but it, may, it, may, it is just as significant as this name for the computer. So if we want to be explicit that this is uh, information about an acquisition, we can, dis we, we can be explicit saying that the type, RDF type, of this concept is uh, company acquisition. We we'll see type in when we talk about the RDF scheme. Uh, 
and the announcement we can add where it was published for example where was it published on this page here we never stop okay <laughs> you really need to stop me or in general we really need uh, to define the stopping criteria what is relevant to us what information do we need to represent and what information or could be true could be there but we don't want to model this is one of the most difficult parts being very clear about what is the perimeter of what we are modeling it's very easy to see to add facts of course we we just assume that some of us may be the most clever between us we already have designed defined all these relationships by taking by reasoning about all the kind of uh, of uh, uh, operations that may happen between companies and what have the information about all of this and we are exploiting that so we are just bare down to the bare facts using properties that we assume that somebody defined for us and they are already suitable for our case so that would be the next step but apart from that we created let's say a graph with the maybe 20 nodes or something like that and if you imagine probably this the first part of the file here Maybe we may, we may have more information about the presidents of the, these companies and the, their budget and the uh, year of foundation and so on, the location, the headquarters and so on. These are static information, basically. Plus, we have a lot of dynamic information that adds up. And since they are connected, it's very easy maybe to follow the chain of acquisitions or to check whether a proposed acquisition is actually being executed or not. So this is just an announcement. Okay. Did they really do it or did they change their mind? And uh, so if we have control about uh, the, the properties, finding new information is just a matter of following uh, a link, a chain of links. Basically. And this is what the Spark QR video language do, will do. We will express in part well the kind of of chains we are looking for, and then we run the query through the set of all the triples, and it will uh, extract a subgraph that will match the chain. Plus some facilities. For example, we wrote here that uh, the details of the acquisition are here, but I also felt the need of saying that the, the announcement of this acquisition was there. So we have two nodes that link to each other. Would it be enough to link from announcement to acquisition? Can we go back with a query? Say, okay, uh, if I didn't have this line, the last line, the two line on the 24, could I go back from uh, uh, acquisition 79 to announcement 124 by querying all the possible announcements who had uh, an acquisition detail matching my node name it's possible but if we have the the, 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 the relationship here it's much easier so one of the elements of reasoning of an rdf graph would be also to uh, complete the information that we might have so if we, if we say that this relationship and this relationship are linked in the sense that one is the reverse of the other then an algorithm could complete all the information that we don't have physically and so make it much much easier to query you don't have to query about everything but you you know that every the key of reasoning in the semantic web technology is uh, linking the facts and having algorithms for making explicit so with an explicit 
uh, as a statement every fact that can in some way be deduced from the others so when we talk about uh, reasoning actually reasoning will be adding a programmatic uh, way an algorithmic way of adding a, a lot of new facts by combining existing ones using the rules that we declare and that will make information that is already there but is implicit it will make it explicit and once it's explicit we can use it we can query it Okay, um, so uh, we, s we felt the, the importance of having some vocabularies where we can pick our names, names of cities, names of companies, names of properties, names of verbs, names of, uh, of locations, and so on. And actually, for making the semantic web useful, they uh, defined a lot of uh, vocabularies. Uh, well, we already saw the prefix strict for doing that, and uh, I just want to show you a list of uh, often used vocabularies. For example, uh, RDF is the, the, the basic one, RDF and RDF schema are the basic ones for defining the RDF language itself. Then we have a, a Dublin Core namespace. Uh, Laura probably mentioned Dublin Core last time, so talking about metadata standards. Of course, this met the Dublin Core metadata has been uh, encoded uh, in, a, in, a, in a, an RDF dictionary, so a lot of uh, information about Dublin Core covers a lot of, uh, uh, of the editorial processes. So who is the author, who is the producer, who is the, when is the publication, and so on, about books, about uh, uh, courses, about uh, uh, all the information process. Uh, we OWL and XSD, or XSD is XML schema, so for data, data types. All uh, we'll see that uh, it's a namespace for the ontologies. Well, uh, we have some. And these are the standard uh, prefixes. But, uh, well, uh, there are others that can be useful. For example, we saw the example of the friend of a friend. But then there are special, specialized vocabularies. For example, if you, uh, you are doing some trade, uh, if you are doing some co cooperation with companies and so on, it's, it's likely that some specific organization has agreed on some standard. Uh, for example, one, one, something that we probably are not very aware of, of uh, uh, the RSS feeds. So, the, the, the format that they use to, to read news or to, for website to, to incorporate news from others are actually written in, in RDF. So they use these technologies in a very simple way. And if you are curious about other prefixes, there's an old, old article that lists some resources if we want actually to model something. And uh, when uh, we see about the... Um, for that, the linked data, we see a lot of other information providers that provide is also their vocabularies, of course, to be before clearing them. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether to talk about this. No. Let's skip this part. Because I want to, okay. Talk a bit about the upper level which is called RDF schema. Then we come back with some details we, if we need them, and uh, there are actually technical details about this serialization. Uh, so RDF is very simple, we, we, we saw. Hmm? Very simple, but it also requires a lot of low-level choices. Um, we said, okay, somebody should publish some vocabularies. If I publish a vocabulary, uh, somebody should be able to tell me that a concept, uh, for example, let's say, that concept is an admin uh, city, an administrative division on level two. So the role of the city, Rome, and the role of administrative division are different. One is the data type, and the other is the item. One is the class, and the other is the instance, in our minds at least. RDF doesn't have any of this notion. 
are give schemas tries to introduce this difference between the type of an object and the object itself. So we can have different objects sharing the same types. A give schema allows us to declare uh, the type of an object, basically, and these objects can be nodes or can be relationships. Um, so, basically, we are trying to introduce a type system for RDF. We are not talking about primitive type, we are talking about object-oriented types, so high-level types. And what is RDF schema? Is it another language? No. It's a vocabulary in RDF. So we use RDF as a representation format. We use a specific vocabulary, which is called RDF schema, that defines five or six keywords, five or six relationship types. And with these relationship types, we define the type system for RDF inside RDF itself. So it's sort of bootstrapping. Hmm? Uh, it's not, uh, so it's very similar to what we have in object-oriented languages. But it's uh, the other way around. When you define uh, um, a class in Java, Python, C Sharp, or whatever you are using as a programming language, usually you define a class, and in the class definition, you leave the data items, which are always hidden, so we don't care, and you define all the properties. What methods do you have? What attributes do you have? Visible attributes, okay, you don't care. This is a closed definition. Once you define a class, the list of its properties is defined. You can always check whether a property is there or not. And this cannot be in the word, in the open word assumption. You cannot limit. Okay, there are dynamic languages where you can add an attribute to an object later on, or to a class, but it's not the normal case. So in the open world, you should describe it in another way. You say, okay, you say describe, I have a property, and this property may apply to this type of class, and may apply to this other type of class. So if you have a class that has already been defined by somebody else, and you want to add another, another property to the class, you don't have to modify the definition of the class. You just declare your own property, saying this property applies to the class. So you can extend very easily. It's strange because you don't see one place with all the properties of a class. You see, you define the properties. And in defining the domain of these properties, you are implicitly saying which are the classes to which the properties apply. Okay. Um, so, if I, uh, in a knowledge-oriented language, I define a, a book class, uh, I have an attribute called author, for example, of type person. This is the normal definition that we are using. In uh, uh, RDF schema, we define the property. We assign the property author, say, we have a property author that may apply to a subject of type document and is an object of type person. And, okay, uh, document, is document a book? Yes, a book is a type of, of document. So we must have also a notion of subclasses. So every class that inherits, that derives from document, is a class to which the author property can be applied. So actually it is the object-oriented type system, but described in a sideways, uh, as I formalized. And uh, this is very easy. For defining the class to which an RDF element, an identifier, belongs, uh, there are two different um, predicates. The first is type, motor vehicle type class. Means that a motor vehicle is a class. It's not an, an instance. We are defining a class. For defining a class, a new class, we just create a new identifier and say that this identifier is of type class. And then we can define my car, your car, his car as 
motor vehicle. Okay, we have the, the verb, the predicate type that links an instance object to a class belonging to it. So in the type predicate, the subject is always an instance and the object is always a class. If we want to be more explicit, we say that motor vehicle actually is a class. The class name is a sort of meta class, okay? It is an upper class that is used for creating classes. This actually is implicit. We could just, for being on the right side of the type, of course, you must be a class. So it's very easy to define classes. For inheritance, so defining subclasses, you also have one relationship which is subclass. Say that, uh, for example, a van and a truck are classes, and a van is a subclass of a motor vehicle, and a truck would be another subclass of motor vehicle. So in a way, if you pick these declarations, uh, motor vehicle type class uh, and uh, van type class, they are all classes, van, truck, motor vehicle, and uh, we are drawing the inheritance graph here. Van is a subclass of motor vehicle. Imagine the chart. Motor vehicle, van, truck, car, and they are all linked to motor, uh, to motor vehicle. They are all classes, but they are all subclasses of motor, motor vehicle. So, it's nothing very complex. But this is the, uh, that we have a van, minivan, passenger vehicle, they are all subclasses of each other. So we have a minivan, which is a passenger vehicle, but is also a van. Multiple inheritance is normal here. And the van and the passenger vehicle and the truck are all motor vehicles. And all of these are classes. So you can imagine having class here, and everybody is pointing, pointing to class. So we are defining the type system, and then for each of these classes, we can create instances. Saying that uh, my car is of type uh, truck, for example. These four classes and instances. And for relationships, again, we declare that a, an identifier is or can be used as a property by saying that it's of type property. So like motor vehicle is type class, I don't know, uh, ransom is a type property. And a property is used to link subject with object. And probably we want to restrict the types of subjects to restrict the types of or the classes of the, of the instances that we use as a subject. And we want to restrict the, the types of the instances that we use as objects. And for doing that, we define a domain and a range for the property. An example. Register2. Register2 is a property. Register2 has the domain motor vehicle. Register2 has the range as person. So Register2 is a, a property, so you can use it as an arrow, that links instances of motor vehicle with instances of person. And the same is here, uh, leg room. So how much space you have for the legs in the rear um, seats? It's a property with a domain passenger vehicle. So the subject is a vehicle, is a, is not the class vehicle, is an instance of vehicle. Okay? And the range in this case is an integral number. One, two, three, seven, how many? inches or centimeters or whatever you have a leg. So the domain could be, in this case, a literal. 
So in the domain, the range could be a literal. So the object is a literal, is not an, uh, an, a class anymore, and not anywhere. Uh, and basically, that's it. We have all the, 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 the languages we need to create objects. Because we define properties of um, everything we are always in the RDF world. Everything is optional, everything can be repeated. So if we only want to declare the domain of a property, and we, de we don't want to declare the range, no problem. Because we know that this property applies to some, but uh, we don't know what kind of nodes it will apply in the future. If you already have a property defined for motor vehicle, and you want to define it also for bicycle, go ahead. Declare that the in another triple that the, the um, register to as a domain bicycle. No problem. Of course, the interpretation of this information is that the domain of the pro is both motor vehicle and bicycle. So we are actually in the union of the domain. So RDF schema is a vocabulary, basically, of, of object-oriented concepts. Nothing more. That allows us to add a few statements at the beginning of our file to declare the type of object uh, that we are dealing with. So basically, you see that uh, class property uh, see, these are the classes defined in RDF schema. Other, other stuff is, is more technical for creating lists, sequences, a little data structures, but they're not very useful. And then type, subclass, subproperties, domain range. These are the key. These two slides are the whole of RDF schema vocabulary. It's not very huge. It's just and all, all of these, uh, the first three or four are, uh, are, the, are the useful ones for, the, for defining uh, what you want. So, um, for example, if we wanted to, de to be more explicit here, we could say that, for example, Oracle is a company. Okay, we would say that uh, uh, our DF RDF type company news company and company is a class and also Java is a company So on. And we can say that companies have company names. How can we say that? We can say that company name is a property. Company name is a property. By the way, RDF type is so important that there's an abbreviation for it. A. You can use this A instead of type. So it's easier to read. RDF company, na company name is A property. It's just a synonym for RDF type to avoid, <laughs> to avoid typing it many, many times. So RDF uh, property is uh, RDF, yes. Because it's, uh, some of them are, have the RDF prefixes, prefix, some of them are RDFS prefix, so we, we, I always need to check. But So company name is a property, and the domain of this property, so news, company name, 
as a domain, domain including those of companies. Stop here. So company name is a property, and the range of this property, so the sorry, the domain of the property, the subjects of these properties are companies. Better to say include companies, because if somebody adds adds other domains, uh, they will include also other. And uh, the range, on the other hand. of a company name is literal, so it's a string. <coughs> so we can have our declarations that in some way help us to understand which uh, properties happen where so on. So it's not forbidden in RDF, it's not possible to forbid uh, to write a uh, company name here. It may appear. Doesn't make sense to have a company name attribute for an acquisition. Company name is not an attribute of acquisition. In RDF, it's perfectly legal, but the RDF schema tells us that it's not the proper way of using the property. It will never be forbidden, <laughs> okay, because we are in the open world. But we declared that property to be used on some kind of object or belonging to a specific class. And Oracle is a company, so Oracle may have the company name property. And this announcement, uh, this acquisition, is it a property? Sorry, is it a company? Is this identifier a company of type company? Yes or no? Ah, wrong answer. We don't know. It, we didn't say it's a company. It doesn't mean it's not a company. We know it's not, but we cannot say that. Okay. It might be a company. It would be a very strange model, but technically RDF doesn't forbid you for saying that oh, this is also a company. And an announcement. And an acquisition. And a buy store. So, of course, you, if you are, you are running in triple, if you are messing with, you, with your type, type system, okay? Speak with C++ programmers, they know it. <laughs> but that will come, okay? Uh, here it's even worse. We are free, there's no safety here, right now. Mm -hmm. But at least we have a declarative way of describing how we want to model it. Okay, I think it's enough for today. And, um, a bit, a bit longer, sorry, for being 10 minutes late. And uh, if you want, uh, you can have a look uh, at some examples of, of RDF uh, uh, on the, by going to DBpedia, which is an RDF version of Wikipedia. Okay, so we can use, uh, we will use it in the exercise uh, Wednesday. Uh, we try to pick some RDF from, from the Wikipedia link to it and create some uh, RDF fragments. Uh, and uh, if you go to this, uh, um, why is that? Sorry, I forgot to put the link on the on the web page. There's this page, which is called Wikipedia with slash online access, and you have all the information about uh, where to find uh, the, the endpoints and the sources for the uh, for the for check for seeing the Wikipedia pages. 
the, the easiest the easy the easy operation to do is to find a, a page and any page on wikipedia and then change the url to this page, the page name is, a, is the name of a normal wikipedia page you take the name and you paste it uh, at the end of this uh, address uh, and you get the deep deep wikipedia so the semantic version of the same page so the rdf is the secret of this page okay okay thanks for everything and see you on Wednesday. Thank <laughs> you.